So if you think that you want to align your money towards climate action, making sure that we don't destroy the planet or the atmosphere of the planet, making sure we're supporting the health of thousands and thousands of species that we are losing these days. If you want to think about regenerative farming and sustainable food systems, uh, if you want to think about racial justice. Welcome to Business Ninjas. Brought to you by Write For Me, where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. This is Max Pittman from Write For Me, and you're listening to another episode of the Business Ninjas podcast. We meet the experts who make things happen in scaling and growing their businesses, and we're going to be telling the, business, the growth stories. And today... We're talking about Pathstone with Mrs. Erica Cart, who is the Executive Managing Director and Chief Impact Officer at Pathstone. Erica, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Max. It's a pleasure to be here. I love it. I love it. It's great to see you again and uh, excited to dive into all the exciting things that are going on at Pathstone. And um, you know, for, for everyone who isn't familiar, Pathstone is in the wealth advising space. It's been around for roughly about 30 years. And um, I want to dive into what's going on with the organization, how you guys are growing and scaling. And before we do that, though, our, our community uh, is built of entrepreneurs, executives like yourself, and lots of sales and marketing leaders. So as the executive managing director and, and chief impact officer at Pathstone, you know, tell our community a little bit about yourself, uh, your role, and some maybe some of the things you're focused on. Okay, well, thank you again for having me, Max. And I have to tell you, I wear a lot of different hats. Today, I'm an executive of, at Pathstone. We're a multifamily office. We advise on over $80 billion in client assets. But um, just two years ago, I was an entrepreneur and a CEO of um, a, a purpose-built impact investment advisory firm called Cornerstone. So again, two years ago, um, I merged the company with Pathstone. And at Cornerstone, our focus was explicitly impact and sustainable investing. But I will tell you that having built that firm from zero to about a billion three in assets under management, I know what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And um, and arguably some days it felt like jumping out of a plane and building the parachute on the way down. Um, but, uh, but it was incredibly gratifying. And to exit to a firm that has such a strong scalable platform that feels great. Um, prior to founding Cornerstone, I was a, a managing director at UBS Investment Bank, where I ran global investment research, global sector research. And so I learned a great deal about um, global investing, macro thematics, and in particular, that's where I started to explore uh, the world of sustainability, uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance analysis. Um, so uh, again, I am a, a believer in the capital markets, in capitalism, that it can be good. I'm very conscious of the fact that it's been messed up over the past decades because of you know, a, a lack of um, thinking about uh, externalities. That said, I still love working in the financial services industry. And at Pathstone, I get the chance to really scale the vision for regenerative capitalism. I love it. That's such a great introduction. And I love you kind of like zero to the 30 billion. I mean, incredible. And um, and I'm curious though, like, I mean, look, like it's it didn't happen overnight, right? Um <laughs> And uh, but like I hear impact and sustainable investing is, is a big theme for, for you. Um, can you tell myself uh, a little bit about what is impact and sustainable investing in, in that focus? Sure. Um, so when we talk about impact investing and sustainable investing, you know, there's other terms. We can talk about uh, values based investing. We can talk about double bottom line, triple bottom line. You know, you can talk about um, uh, socially responsible investing. There's a million terms that we can use for, you know, values aligned investing and what it means simply is deploying your assets, investing your money in such a way that it's consistent with some of your fundamental beliefs about the world. So if you think that you want to align your money towards climate action and making sure that we don't destroy 
the planet or the atmosphere of the planet, making sure we're supporting the health of thousands and thousands of species that we are losing these days. If you wanna think about regenerative farming and sustainable food systems, uh, if you wanna think about racial justice, social justice, um, gender equity, if you want to think about um, anything from, you know, quantum computing and how it affects carbon emissions throughout the global transportation system, or if you want to think about mental health and what that means from the standpoint of, you know, society, if you want to invest your money around any of those issues, you can use sustainable and impact investment uh, activities as the way to do it. It is very, very powerful when you can get market rate returns and social impact at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as you can see, I have, a, I have a lot of energy around this, notwithstanding being on Wall Street for 30 years. <laughs> so it's not, basically it sounds like there's a prioritization in sustainable sustainability and social responsibility as part of the investment strategies of past seven. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, my team, kind of the impact investment team is made up of, of colleagues from all different functions of the firm. So mm -hmm. folks in the advisory business, folks in our research organization, business development, operations, marketing, there, you know, we come together as an impact committee and we work with experts and colleagues, asset managers, asset owners outside of the firm together you know, we create a service proposition that is frankly unparalleled. Um, so I'm very fortunate to be able to drive that impact uh, capability at Pastel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot recently about ESG, environmental, social, and government factors. It sounds like that's definitely part of your investment strategies. Like what benefits, I guess, does this approach have or provide to potential clients? Just kind of curious. Right. Well, there, there is a big, you know, controversy right now. There's pushback on the idea of analyzing ESG factors in the context of any investment services. There's a lot of pushback because there's a perception that ESG is something political. It's actually not. It is something analytical. Um, that said, if you are doing the systematic analysis of the environmental, social, and governance factors that are that are material, that matter to an investment decision from the standpoint of risk and return, if you are using this analysis appropriately, you can completely keep it away from political issues. It's about transparency. It's about more information that is investor useful. So I'll give you an example. Um, if I'm talking to a beverage company, an example, um, I do want to hear about how they use water, how they source it, how they get access to it, how they protect it. The water issues for a beverage company are very material from the standpoint of their operations and their ultimate profits, right? By the way, water is also very important to semiconductor companies and to oil drilling companies. It's a critical input to their processes, right? You've got to know that you have um, a, a license to operate with, with water being one of the keys, right? So that's water. If you think about the idea of uh, safety, okay, a social issue. Well, it's not a social issue for a shipping company or a manufacturing company, it is an issue of business. So if a safety track record for a manufacturing company or a shipper is not good and people are dying, well, there's gonna be all kinds of risk associated with that financial risk, right? And so obviously that's a, aside from the societal issue. So you're asking those kind of companies questions about safety, right? Mm -hmm. If we're talking about a mining company and they're spending $10 billion on a mine, well, they better have good community relationships where they operate because otherwise the mine's going to shut down and they're going to throw away $10 billion, right? That goes right to the bottom line. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about material factors in the realm of ESG, we're talking about the stuff that matters for profits, right? Cost, profits, risk, opportunity. So um, 
So when used properly, ESG analysis is a tool. You can use it for any kind of investing you want. Um, there are certain things that um, some people uh, it can't accept as fact. Uh, I accept the science of climate change. I will accept that as fact. Um, there are certain things that um, are bigger picture in the in the realm of social issues, diversity. Okay, I am willing to accept all the science and all the uh, academic literature that shows that diverse groups make better decisions. Right, I am willing to accept that fact as far as we know it, and work towards women's economic empowerment, gender equity, um, racial justice. So this is about diversity, right? So mm -hmm. it's a very, very extensive field when we think about what sits in ESNG. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is all investment processes should deploy ESG analysis, even if they don't say that they're doing it. The backlash, I would argue, is based um, primarily on ignorance um, ideology. Um, uh, basically, those are the two things that make it politicized. Other than that, you have to do ESG analysis to do good investment research. Interesting. That's a, yeah, really, really interesting. Like what you, you talked a little bit about the environmental, the social. Like I, I'm still a little unclear. I, that's that's just me though. Um, like what, the governance of this, right? Is tell me a little bit about like how that plays into you know the strategies. Okay. So the G, actually, arguably, it's the only thing we have to talk about. Mm. And the E and the S and the G, governance, it, it's first among equals. I would argue that if a company is well-governed, their board of directors and executives on down are thinking about the environmental and social environment where they operate, right? That's good governance. You have to think about that. If a company is not thinking about the environmental and social impacts on what they do, they're not well governed. So it's kind of tautological. So if we only used the governance lens, that's pretty good. Gotcha. And so when we think in the place of a board of directors, right, the job, governance, stewardship, long term risks and opportunities, that's what the board of directors needs to be thinking about for good goggles. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate the education, Erica, and, and understanding like how that plays into, you know, your strategies and how, how I guess, you know, how does Pathstone, I guess, tailor the, their wealth, your wealth management solutions to meet the unique needs of, you know, and goals of each individual or, or family client that you work with? So it's, a, you know, it, it's the word that you use, you know, how do we tailor mm. what we do? I mean, it really does start with the client. It starts yeah. with the family. It starts with the foundation. What are their aspirations? What do they want to achieve both financially and with regard to society, environmental and social issues? But it really starts with a conversation and you find out what are your priorities. And, and, and then we start to talk about what are the kind of intersectional issues Right. So you can't really tease out when a client says, I'm all about women's economic empowerment, gender equity. Well, that you, can, you can't just go for that. You think about how do we go for that? So we use a frame um, uh, for our impact measurement and the frame of access. All right. Because we think it's a great single common denominator for all the aspirations of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, all right? So let's say a client says, I'm all about gender equity, let's invest this way. And I'll say, great, we want access to gender equity. So in the course of that, we also need access to education, access to healthcare, access to broadband, access to capital, access, 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 that's where it's at. So the investing turns to be more in depth and more thorough with the starting point of what you want to achieve. And having those kind of robust conversations helps us figure out where we're going. Now, at the very start, we're going to traditionally create an investment policy statement 
We'll think about the asset allocations. We'll talk about, you know, timing and liquidity and risks. And, you know, we'll talk about, again, the asset allocation. Do you want to do um, your investing through equities or public or private or fixed income? We'll talk about the traditional, traditional things you talk about when you create a, a portfolio, right? Sure. But we can get really, really specific, as specific as we want, and most importantly, as specific as a client wants. And what's really important to know is that you can achieve both financial objectives and social and environmental objectives at the same time. You mm -hmm. don't have to give up aspirations in either case. You have to just think about all kinds of capital, human capital, natural capital, and of yeah. course, financial capital. Yep. Yeah, I love it. It's, um, yeah, this is uh, the strategy, like, is, is I think about like my own personal experience and in, in my investments and my family's investments and like, do I want to invest in, you know, a company like a cigarette, like a cigarette brand, right? Like, <laughs> Kind of, but you know, based on their numbers, but also at the same time, like there's there's other ways to make to, to make money on my investments besides you know thinking about thinking about the cancer that you know they're giving our people, right? Um, yeah. Right. So like uh, you know what what you've created, what, like what your focus is. Um, I I like how you you've been doing this for for how long, right? Like it's this has been this has been like, like since you got off Wall Street, has this been like your goal, like and been your focus? Well, um, so I've been in the business, the investment business for about 30 years, and it was about 20 years ago that I began to really systematically understand mm -hmm. sustainable investing. And I've just gotten more and more engaged. And, and as we really use the tool of ESG analysis um, to really understand it in a much more nuanced way, um, what we can do. And I would tell you, I love that you use the, you know, the tobacco example, because I will tell you that there are actually some people who would define themselves as sustainable investors who are comfortable owning a tobacco company mm -hmm. because they believe that the magnitude and the pace of the change of tobacco companies transforming away from burnt, burning tobacco and the health hazards they feel like the transformation is happening and good things could potentially come, hmm. you know, of a reorientation of a tobacco company. You could actually see improved health in some ways, right? Hmm. So, you know, that's not a traditional way of thinking. But again, I go, it's my clients' values and needs first. And we can figure out how to do whatever they need to do. And we can figure out if they want to have kind of concessionary returns. They're willing to give up market rate returns to have more impact more quickly. Mm -hmm. That's good too, you know? But um, mm -hmm. again, everything, everything, every investment has impact. And whatever's going on in the world, right? Whether it's discussions of quantum computing and AI and what that means to carbon emissions or um, digital health and mental health and how you can invest to further those, you know, progressive ideas, we can talk about all of it. So for me, you know, the more I learn, the more I want to learn. Yeah. You know, so yep. that you know, a little bit, it's become more nuanced, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like that's become almost the secret sauce that that Erica, you know, has has developed, right? But you tell me, like, why why would I go with you know you and, and the team at Pathstone? I, I I've heard a lot of things that would kind of draw me there, but what what would you say separates you? and your strategies and your team over, over the competition. Probably a mixture of, of all of what I just mentioned, but I'd love to hear it from your, from your mouth. <laughs> so much, I can't, where do I begin? I mean, what's wonderful is to work for a firm that has the breadth and depth of capabilities that Pathstone does. We have a tremendous research team, a tremendous client operations team, you know, a tremendous advisory team. Um, so, so together, um, we can pretty much offer pretty much any service that a family or foundation needs. So whether it's um, work on uh, taxes and accountants and uh, accounting and trusts, estates, or you know, helping our clients navigate through their complex bill pay capabilities, or whether they need to buy goats for their farm, that's we can do that too. 
Um, so in terms of serving a family and then offering products from the most kind of um, uh, data oriented products to have incredibly um, tax efficient structured portfolios, um, or whether it's about trust capabilities, complex uh, trust planning, all of it can be done at Pathstone. And then when it comes to where I sit, you know, investment advisory, um, I would argue that some of our thematic investment research and market strategy commentaries across asset classes is second to none in the field of wealth advisory. And at, at this point, I believe we are if not the, one of the um, largest independent investment advisors in the country. Oh, amazing. Incredible what we've done, Erica. It really is. And, um, you know, when you think about like what, what's next, right? What, what are the challenges you know, that you see? You know, maybe it's and maybe it's from a market perspective. Like what maybe what challenges are you seeing from, you know, market perspective today? And like, but, and also I'd love to hear like what challenges that, you know, you're looking to overcome in the next year, maybe as a business too. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that goes from the very large to the, you know, the very micro, the micro sure. to the yeah. macro. I mean, right now, you know, even someone who's like me who's been in the business for 30 years, you know, and I think, oh, you know, our, you know, debt ceiling, um, you know, bringing us to default. I mean, it's incomprehensible. We couldn't possibly do that. But you know what? It's not zero, the possibility that this could happen. And if we have to go and reprice every asset on the face of the earth based on a debt ceiling default, I mean, this is serious risk. Again, I feel confident that we'll get through it, but you know, we've got the big macro issues. Are we in an, an earnings recession? How, uh, when will the Fed potentially have to start easing as opposed to you know, the hikes that they're doing? So all the macro questions are there. That's a big challenge, right? Obviously, the ESG pushback we talked about, big challenge. Um, what we're going, what we're seeing with regard to the AI uh, data, investing in AI is not just investing in tech companies or an m and in the field. It's understanding the business models for every industry and what AI means. And potentially, not just from the opportunity for chat GPT, but what are the risks? As an example, a credit card company that has all that data, could they inadvertently be doing profiling illegally of their clients? You, you know, you have, to, you have to think about the governance of AI. These things are all really big challenges. That said, we're going to meet them. Um, we're going to think hard and hopefully be great uh, stewards of capital. That's my job to be to steward our clients' capital. So these are all really big challenges, but with you know, thoughtfulness um, and again, systematic um, analysis of the big issues, um, we can get through this. I'll give you an example of the very near term. We're working on a piece um, of um, investment research on mental health. How do we invest in such a way that we can make progress on this huge challenge? So we are doing, you know, understanding the lived experience of everyone from those who have suffered uh, sexual violence, chronic pain, bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, um, uh, you know, all these lived experiences that we know people, it affects us. So we're doing research to figure out how can we um, bring our clients ideas that they can invest, that we can make real scalable progress in a field where, you know, there's not that much of an ecosystem or infrastructure yet. So that's another example of a huge challenge that I believe, you know, for our part, we can help meet those challenges. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you think like you want to be, you know, celebrating, you know, a year from now, like what is it that, you know, is top of mind for you that, you know, maybe Pathstone as an organization is, is looking to accomplish by the end of maybe this year or a year from, from today in May? Hmm. Well, for one thing, uh, in terms of kind of who we are and our, our strength, I would like to say that, um, you know, we've uh, reached a milestone of, of advising on over 100 billion in client assets. And that milestone, the reason it's so important is because, again, we are an independent firm, uh, independently owned, and, and, and that means 
um, arguably we can move more quickly to address some of these big challenges. So from a business standpoint, I'd like us to meet that milestone. More importantly, I want to be able to say, you know, how much can we help our clients who are absolutely committed to some sort of um, social or environmental impact? I would love to be able to go like hand in hand with some of our clients publicly saying, look, we did this, we invested, we transformed our entire portfolio and look what we're doing. So uh, yeah. we can do that, but I would like to do it in a bigger way. I love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think like, you know, your ability to, to dive deep into, you know, your own commitment and your team's commitment into sustainability, social responsibility, you know, kind of showcase how Pasto and like integrates your own unique principles into its wealth management practices. And it's just, like it's it's a breath of fresh air to, to hear compared to probably what what most of us are being told on the TV <laughs> as well, right? Uh, and yeah, it's it's really really insightful to to hear how you guys are growing, how you how you've brought from cornerstone out of past stone, and how you guys have undertaken um, been able to like think about sustainability practices beyond its you know beyond your you know investment activities. And uh, you know I love to love to like hear a little bit about like where you guys are going to be in the community. You know what's what's next for you like where can people find you as well ah, well uh, the truth is i'm very easy to find you know i'm pretty active on linkedin um in terms of you know talking about the events that, that we sponsor that we create the research that we put out there so access to you know thematic investment research um really just you know ping me send me an email ecarp at pathstone.com um, or linkedin with regard to events that we host um, we do some of those more, you know, smaller scale, but we do a lot of speaking. So, for instance, there's a big Opal conference coming up on uh, family offices uh, in a month or so. I'll be in uh, uh, in Florence at the Carlisle Family Forum. Um, again, a, a lot going on in terms of events and conferences out there. So I'm really easy to communicate with, you know. Yes. And again, Beautiful. go to our website, pathstone.com, and you'll see a lot of what we have to offer there. Yeah. And next, yeah I'm also going to send you, we just literally just this week published a new Pathstone impact report. So mm -hmm. I'll make sure you have that. Please feel free to use it for however you want to spread the word. Yeah, I appreciate you sh like sharing that. And, uh, you know, also a lot of specific examples of, you know, your sustainable investment opportunities you guys have done and identified and try to incorporate in a, your own uh, portfolios and everyone who's listening. You know, if this sounds interesting, yeah, definitely reach out to eCarp. Uh, K, K Carp is with a K, E K R A R P, uh, if I can spell it, uh, at passstone.com and uh, check out check out the website. And if you guys are interested in reaching out uh, to hear more about their practices, definitely let let us know or let Erica know that we you heard it from the Visits and Just podcast too. Um, and uh, Erica, look, it's it's been really special, I think, talk, talking with you and, and getting to know you and getting to know Passstone and it's great to know there's companies uh, and, and organizations out there like yourself that are uh, really taking a, uh, a handle on, uh, you know, how how it's how we should be investing in, in the 21st century. That's that's uh, that's really impactful, and it's great to hear that. Yeah, thank you, Max. It's a real pleasure. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of the Business Ninjas podcast. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for listening, and everyone, go check out Pathstone.com and reach out to Erica. And um, looking forward to. Yeah, uh, uh, making this happen. So thank you again for being here. Thanks for listening, everyone. That wraps up another episode of the Business Ninjas podcast. Everyone have a great rest of the day.